So what's artificial intelligence? Some people think that artificial intelligence is just any use of a computer, but that's not right. When you use your computer simply to add a couple of numbers or multiply a couple of numbers, that's not artificial intelligence. It's only artificial intelligence when the program learns or reprograms itself. This is sometimes called machine learning or deep learning. And it does this in order to reach a goal more effectively. The programmers specify what the goal is, and then the machine learns how to reach that goal more effectively and efficiently by reprogramming itself or gathering more data or through other methods. Notice that intelligence of this kind does not require consciousness. The machine can reach the goal without being happy that it reached the goal or sad that it failed to reach the goal. It doesn't have to have that type of consciousness or phenomenal consciousness as philosophers sometimes call it. Here's an example. I think a lot of people know that uh, a machine beat Ken Jennings, the Jeopardy champion of all time, who's now one of the hosts. And it beat Gary Kasparov, the world champion at chess. Maybe a little less known, but in some ways more impressive, AlphaGo beat the world champion at Go. Now, Go is a game where you take black and white stones and put them at certain spots on the board in order to capture your opponent's uh, pieces. It's a very complicated game because there's so many different places you can put the stones. Not like chess where you can only move the pieces certain ways, you can put them anywhere you want on the board. And that means there are billions upon billions upon billions of options. And you simply cannot figure out which move to make by thinking, well, if I do this, they'll do that. And if I do this, then they'll do that. That's very difficult. So champion Go players typically think in terms of patterns. This part of the board is vulnerable, so I should attack there. This part of the board needs to be made stronger, and so on. They get a sense of the patterns. And a lot of people thought that computers couldn't do that. Also, a lot of people think that computers can't be creative. But in this match against the champion Go player, AlphaGo made a move that was seen by all the experts as a mistake. I think it was move 23 in game four, but whatever move it was, they thought it was making a mistake. And it turned out that it helped AlphaGo win the game. Now, that's the bad news that the human got beat. But the next game, the human picked up on that move and used that same move to beat AlphaGo. So this shows you that the computer is not simply going step by step, but is looking at patterns and also that it can be creative. Now that machine was a lot fancier than the ones that we have. We have, say, a smartphone that can take voice commands from you. But even in that smartphone, it can get better and better as it listens to you more and more and knows when it misinterpreted you. So it's now picking up on your, your idiosyncratic pronunciation or your accent or a vocabulary that you use that's unusual. So it can improve and learn as it goes on and on through this process. Same for a smart home. It can learn when you need more heat because you're in the room and when it can turn it down because you're not in the room. And it can learn by studying your patterns as you move throughout your room. A slightly more controversial use is driverless cars. We'll talk about them a lot later, but for now, the basic idea is simply that they have sensors that see their environment, but they also learn from that environment. So they learn which roads are more likely to be slippery, which areas pedestrians are more likely to step in front of the car, and so on. One important feature is that they have accidents, just like humans do. Look in the lower left, you'll see the result of a driverless car having a horrific accident. And the driver was killed, and that's very horrible, of course, but notice that if humans do the same thing, and when humans do it, they usually don't learn from each other. Whereas 
the computer program that was driving that car was readjusted so other cars will not make the same mistake. So it can learn not just from its own experience, but it can learn from the experience of other autonomous vehicles uh, as well. Yet another use of AI today is in medicine. Artificial intelligence is used to look at photographs of skin lesions in order to determine which ones are benign and which ones are malignant and therefore require surgery. It can look not just at the lesions that a particular doctor looks at, but it can look at all the lesions of all the doctors around the country or around the world. And that way it can build up a larger database and become even more accurate uh, than at least most doctors, maybe even more accurate than the best doctors. Now there's a problem, which I bet some of you are aware of. Notice the photo. They all have light colored skin. The program was criticized because it did not get trained on dark colored skin and therefore was not as good at picking out malignant lesions in people with dark skin. But notice also, that there's a solution to that. You train it on people with dark skin. And if it knows which lesions are benign and which lesions are malignant in the ones that it studies, then it can use that information to predict which lesions are malignant in people with light skin or dark skin. So it's not gonna be perfect at the start, but it can learn. IBM's Watson shows another pattern, which is also very useful. There was a patient in Japan who had a horrible disease that was killing them and the doctors didn't know what to do. So they asked IBM, IBM's Watson machine uh, to diagnose and Watson came up with the proper diagnosis and saved the patient's life. But how did it do that? Look in the lower right, you'll see that it sifted through 20 million cancer research papers. Now, my doctor doesn't have time to read 20 million cancer research papers. So this machine is able to know the literature a lot better than any living doctor. Here it's using the information from other doctors, other people around the world, and improving its performance in diagnosing illnesses. Very useful. A little more questionable here is the use of AI in criminal law. Now, it could be used in many different ways, but I'm going to focus on the use of AI to decide who gets released pre-trial. So a person is arrested, they get an arraignment, they're going to wait for their trial, but the judge or somebody has to decide whether to release that person and let them go home and live at home while they're waiting for their trial, which might be months or even a years away. That decision is usually made on the basis of a prediction of whether the defendant is likely to show up for the trial when it eventually happens, or is likely to commit a crime while they're out waiting for their trial to happen, such as threatening a witness or even killing a witness. Now, judges make these decisions very quickly. They often have less than five minutes to decide this very important question. Because after all, if the person is not released, and in jail, they could lose their job, their house, their family. This could be a big problem, even if they're eventually found innocent. So judges make this decision very quickly on the basis of their experience and some reading, but an AI system can look at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases around the country or around the world for that matter, in order to better predict which defendants are likely to show up for trial, and which defendants are likely to commit crimes if they're released pre-trial. Now, again, like in the skin lesion case, there have been objections, especially regarding racial disparities. So that in some of the programs that are used, give uh, pre-trial release more often to white defendants than to black defendants, and that's not fair. But we can fix it because we know the basis on which it's making the decision, and we know the rates at which it's granting pretrial release, and so we can correct for that. It's much more difficult to correct judges. You tell them that they're 
being racially discriminatory, and they'll almost always say, no, I'm not. And it's very difficult to prove that they are. And it's also very difficult to correct. So there might be some advantages, even though uh, there are going to be problems that need to be solved. Another use, also controversial, is AI in the military. In the lower left, you see the use of AI in an autonomous drone uh, or weapon that is being used to attack, uh, or in this case, to monitor performance. But I'm gonna look, we're gonna talk about that later. So I'm gonna look now at uh, the use in the upper right, which is to comb through people's telephone messages, email messages, social media, and so on, in order to identify potential terrorists. Now, that can be very useful in stopping terrorist attacks, like the one in the lower right, but it raises questions of privacy. Do you really want the government monitoring all of those messages that you send, supposedly in private, and your phone conversations, and so on? So although it's useful, it raises a lot of ethical issues. And I wanna end this list of uses of AI with one case that is particularly problematic for some people. These days, we have an epidemic of loneliness, especially among seniors, and it's particularly hard in Japan. <clears throat> so people who lose their spouses, but are still alive and need someone to take care of them, their children might not be able to move and live next to them, and they might not be able to find good human live-in care 24 hours a day. And so they sometimes turn to uh, robot caregivers that use AI to understand their patients and better serve them. 